so let's talk a little bit about Dropbox to start. We have over 200 million users now. Um, we do over a billion file syncs a day. This is all runs on tens of thousands of physical servers split and also EC2 instances. Uh, we also have thousands of MySQL servers running completely hosted in our own data centers. And Dropbox today is more than just about files. It's also about camera uploads. Um, we have rich APIs and platform integrations. You probably have seen Yahoo has uh, Dropbox integration now for file attachments. Um, also, Facebook groups have this, has this as well. You can uh, attach files to Facebook groups through Dropbox. So let's take a look at like our road to 100 million users. That, um, that was through November 2012. The growth to 200 million users um, has taken place over the last year. So the growth has been really immense, especially recently. Um, and so let's talk about who actually runs this infrastructure. So that's the Dropbox server team. Um, we run both infrastructure in AWS and our own data centers. Uh, until a year ago, we ran this operation with about 12 people. Um, it's been a kind of a rocky road at times, supporting two architectures. We think we've got a formula that works now for this hybrid architecture. Um, the f and I think you're going to see a lot more architectures like this, and really this is kind of our blueprint to it. So the first part consists of system engineers. These guys kind of know the ins and outs of Linux. They handle like base system configuration for us. Um, they handle AMIs inside of Amazon. Um, they do everything from bare metal to public configuration. The second piece of the puzzle for us was the SREs. These guys keep, Dropbox, keep the Dropbox service up and running, both in AWS and our own data centers. We handle things like machine management, service management, metrics and monitoring, basically all the things that keeps the service up and alive. The next part to the team is the, uh, the Dropbox infrastructure developers. These guys are the ones that are actually writing the backend services. These are um, data storage for metadata, um, lots of different pieces of, of the puzzle happens on the back end that they work on. So I've used the term hybrid architecture a couple times, um, and so this is what I mean by that. Basically, it's managed, uh, co-located, dedicated hardware that you're running yourselves, coupled with a storage, uh, with a cloud provider, be it App Engine, AWS, GCE, Rackspace, um, any of the numerous cloud providers. I'm not going to actually talk about the pros and cons of, of hybrid architectures here. Uh, Kuhn's going to do that tomorrow, so he's going to do that in a little bit in a keynote. Um, I believe that hybrid architectures are sort of like what you're going to see in the industry moving forward for medium to larger scale uh, infrastructure. So the Dropbox architecture and how we use the hybrid, how we actually support this in hybrid clouds. So we have Dropbox clients. These guys, um, this can be your API client, so your mobile phone. This can be the desktop client. This could be the website. Basically, any way you interact with Dropbox. Um, this includes APIs. Um, the client will connect to a Dropbox data center where we host metadata. The metadata is basically the same sort of data you'd see in Linux inodes, basically pointers to where the actual data is. Um, this also, this allows us to do things like rollback and things like that in the Dropbox client. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is Amazon, which is where we actually do our storage. So we use S3 and we front that with EC2 instances. These EC2 instances basically provide a way for us to do authentication into S3. So the Dropbox client will receive information from the metadata storage system and then talk to the storage system to retrieve those, to retrieve those bits. So you can see we have two just completely different pieces of infrastructure here. We have our, our data centers and we have Amazon. So initially, this was really fragmented. We were one team, essentially 12, 15 people with two different, sort of, two different missions. One, to support Amazon, and then two, to support our own data centers, which are pretty, fairly substantial. So this fragmented work it was really hard to move between the two systems, and we just didn't. And the tools were developed in isolation. Basically, people working on the Amazon side built Amazon tools, and people that were working in the data center built data center tools. So over the last 18 months, we realized that treating our development this way was sort of it was wrong essentially. Um, so we tried to refocus the team on a singular goal. Um, this goal is to create a tool chain that treated the hybrid environment as a first-class architecture. So. Initially, we had these two sort of circles, data centers, um, providers. Um, and in our data centers, we worried about things like network engineering, Nagios, Bind, Pixie booting machines, Ganglia, basically all your buzzword data center old style architecture things. In Amazon, we had the same problem. We worried about AMIs, SQS, Route 53, all the Amazon specific technologies. What we didn't do 
is think about how we can like sort of merge these two worlds together. So we, when we started thinking about this, we said, okay, let's not focus on the specific technologies. Let's actually think about what concepts um, are the same between these two pieces of, between these two systems. So the first thing we focused on was sort of the installation. The second thing we thought that was important to focus on was inventory, where inventory means not necessarily an inventory system, but basically how you keep track of your machines. And the last thing was the machine life cycles, basically how, how do you use the machine through the system. So the installations, and this includes configuration management, and this is where the system engineers sort of fall into play. This is what we originally sort of looked like in terms of installation and config management. Um, like I said, EC2 was done in isolation. Uh, data centers were done in isolation. We had two different tool chains completely. Uh, in EC2, we ran basically shell scripts, Python scripts, things like that to do configuration. Um, in our own data centers, we were using Puppet. Uh, it was not so great. So basically, we had pixie booting in our data centers. We would do bare bones. Uh, bare bones Linux installs, and we said, okay, this can be, we can extend this idea. Um, we can just basically do the bare minimum to get Linux onto a, onto a, works, onto a server. Um, so, and then we said, okay, in Amazon, everybody else does like this bakery concept of like baking their AMIs with code. They're trying to basically make it repeatable. Um, but for us, that's like actually not a great pattern. Um, when we do, if we were to do that, we would be, end up supporting basically baked images in Amazon, and we'd be still having to find out some, figure out some code deploy system within our own data centers. So we ended up not doing that, and we think we cooked up uh, some Linux setups that works better for us. So what we do is we actually run Puppet in both now. We uh, have it do all configuration. We actually don't do anything in the installation frameworks at all. Um, it's sort of an, it was it's really obvious to us, like once we were finished with this thing, that this is the way we should have done this and approach this from the start. Uh, but it took us a while to sort of iterate through this and realize, hey, you know what? We don't have to do, we don't have to follow the patterns that everyone else thinks is important. Um, so the, our big takeaway here is it, don't think it's easy to combine systems later. It's actually not. Um, we actually went through a bunch of iterations with this. We had 1.2 Puppet installs, one for Amazon and one for our own data centers. Um, they, that was actually a really, it took a lot of work to combine those things into one repo, refactor the things that were important to us, like user management, refactor sysctls, all of that had to be combined. Um, and that was, that was a decent amount of work. So definitely don't think it's easy to con combine things. Um, it's some, sometimes better to like, do the work up front. So the second thing we, second concept we sort of tackled was life cycles. This is really sticky to us because there's a huge difference between treating, between dealing with Amazon and dedicated hardware in, in, in any sense that there is. Um, the life cycles are just really different. So this is what most people probably do on Amazon, right? You, if you have a problem, you just destroy your instance, just move on with your lives, don't worry about it. Um, and it's pretty, it, it's a nice concept, I must admit. We actually even have scripts that monitor our instances and they're like, oh, if this instance has problems, we're just gonna reboot it um, or we're gonna relaunch it. Um, we're, not gonna, we're just gonna move on with li our life and we're not gonna worry about it. It doesn't work in the data center. Um, the data center, you have to repair the machines. They cost money, right? You can't just say, this is Amazon's problem. We don't care about the underlying hardware. We actually care about the underlying hardware. Um, and we have a lot of it. So there's no dumping servers. We have to figure out a way to, to deal with this. So we said, okay, is there a way we can do this? So we basically fake it. Um, we then designed a lifecycle uh, that allows our developers to have clean interfaces to allocate and deallocate machines to themselves, but they don't have to worry about the hardware. The interesting thing here for us is that we approached this from the, this problem came up from the data center tech's point of view. They had been, a, very, a lot of companies that had a lot of machines before, and they had always had this problem where, you know, they have to coordinate very highly with a developer or a sysadmin or an SRE to get the machine back to do a repair. Um, a lot of times, you know, if you just have one bad disk, they want to coordinate the disk removal. They don't actually want to, they don't want to take the machine offline. Well, we said when we build our system, that's not the way you get to deal with this. Developers have to give the machine back to the pool, for, to the repair pool. They can't keep that machine and try to work with the data center tech. Um, so this to me is an example of how we found overlap between Amazon and our data centers. We basically had developers on one side that wanted to move machines around really quickly and get things allocated to themselves, deallocate these machines, just like they do in Amazon. We had our data center techs that were used to living in a world where things had to be highly coordinated between them, a DBA, an SRE, basically anybody that actually touched that system. Um, 
And we said, you know, we're not just not going to support this. This is going to make the system, we're going to make the developers and the SREs and everyone um, live in a world where they can just give, where they have to give them hardware back. And we have a free pool that's like a buffer that, you know, if you give your back your web server, you just take a new machine out of the free pool um, and you just move on with your life and it goes to the repair queue. Um, and we try to apply this concept across the board. Databases are sticky, but, you know, they have stateful data. But for the most part, we do a promotion, we move on with our lives, the database just goes into the repair queue. So find overlap between your systems. It's really important. Um, when you have that overlap, you can sort of take advantage of, uh, uh, you can take advantage of making the team much more efficient. So the last piece of, the last piece of the puzzle that we've tackled so far is the inventory system. Um, as I said before, Dropbox is split 50-50 between Amazon and our own data centers. Um, and so we wanted to basically have the best of both worlds here. Um, we wanted to use some of the power of Amazon, some of the power of our own systems. We needed to find a solution that would work for machine management. So Amazon has a great concept called tags. You can basically tag anything to, a, to an EC2 instance. It's extra metadata describing what it does. Um, we've populated this data a long time ago in EC2, but we had never used it directly. Um, we had actually basically just generated lists of machines. We just counted from one to N, and those were the host name, you know, host name, uh, number, dot Dropbox, dot com, essentially. Um, so we had the tags. And on our side, we had this thing called MDB. It's our machine database. Uh, Dropbox built this to manage our machines within our own data centers. Um, and so we said, okay, we have this great concept, tags and EC2, we wanna leverage this. And our MDB system works very similarly. You basically can assign tags to machines or attributes, which are key value pairs. Um, and the tags denote what service is actually running on that machine, similarly to how we were doing this in Amazon, but not utilizing it. So now we just basically import the Amazon tag system into our MDB, which allows us to have a unif unified view of every machine we have. Um, then we, ex we actually re-export this data to flat files so systems can consume it on, without having to connect to the database. Uh, we didn't want to design something where the database was intrinsically part of like, the production system. Um, so this let us, this gave us a lot of, th there's a lot of overlap here, and like, the integration here really was pretty simple, um, and it really let us leverage the power of our machine management system. So initially, this is what, sort of how we configured stuff. We'd have an RPC that we'd call to get up, to set up monitoring for a host in our own data center via the MDB client. And then, you know, we would step through a range function, essentially, to get our Amazon instances and set up monitoring for them. We would then, you know, in the monitoring, this is actually not that contrived of code. This is pretty similar to what we were doing. If a host starts with DL, which is, you know, the machines in Amazon, you do your EC2 stuff, and then you call your Nagios, you set up Nagios like normal um, for the rest of it. Uh, this kind of code translates pretty well into this, um, where you set up your monitoring, you know, you can, you, you basically call your, your get all host functions and you call set up monitoring and now you have a, you have an attribute on host that's is it EC2 or not, um, and you can just do the, it, it makes it much cleaner, you can read this code, you can, it's very easy for a new hire to come in and say, hey, you know what, I need to, uh, you know, I need to do something case, uh, case based on EC2, um, or is, is prod basically as our other definition. Um, so this, this made things a lot simpler for us. So in this case, we, we should have prioritized overlapping work. We had two systems that were very similar. Um, had we done this in the, it, it, earlier on, I think we would have been in a much better state in terms of machine management. Um, we are also able to leverage sort of that tags concept. Um, we actually expose this in a puppet, for example. Uh, so puppet's able to look at our tags within the system and configure hosts based on that. There's a lot of future work, though, for us still. Um, we have to unify our code deployment systems. Right now, we still have two code deployment systems, one for our data centers, one for EC2. I think there's a lot of good work that can be done there for us. Um, we haven't moved off functional host names in EC2. I didn't really touch on this, but one thing we found really powerful within our own data centers is we don't name anything with a, we don't call anything like web.dropbox.com or web1 or whatever. We actually just do all location-based naming. Um, this makes, this abstracts a lot of the, extracts, extracts a lot from the actual physical hardware um, and allows us to, you know, make it a little more cloud-like within our own data center. We haven't done that in EC2. Um, it's, it's work that needs to be done. Um, and also sort of common metrics for capacity planning. We don't have a good way of moving back and forth between EC2 capacity planning and our own data centers. Um, so that means, you know, if you're starting up a new service, you have to think about this. You have to worry about, is this going to be an EC2? Well, then I have to look at the EC2 sort of uh, 
the how cores work in EC2 versus how cores work in our own data centers. Um, so this is something we could potentially work on, finding a common metric so a team can say, hey, you know, I want to move my service from Amazon to Dropbox or Dropbox into Amazon because I think this is going to be more efficient or it needs to be closer to the data. Um, and that would, there's a lot of work there that could be really, really, really good for us. So keys for living in a hybrid world. Don't think it's easy to combine things. It's not that simple. Think about it before you actually do it. Um, find the overlap between the systems. Once you find the overlap, there's usually a lot of things that you can leverage there. Um, and prioritize that work. Once you start prioritizing that work, your, your team will become a lot more efficient. Uh, it's something that I think we didn't realize early on. We built a lot of things in isolation. Uh, and had we prioritized sort of the overlap between the systems, we could have, the system would have been much more powerful early on. So we are hiring. There's a lot of interesting problems, I think, that, that Dropbox has to solve. Uh, on machine management, on the SRE side, on the infrastructure side, um, it's no, by no means finished. Um, it's growing very, very rapidly. I mean, you, can, you saw the growth curves earlier. Uh, I don't think we're going to be slowing down anytime soon.